Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, my name is Jin Park, as was introduced. Um, I am the moderator of this morning session. Um, we have had two speeches this morning from uh, Minister Cho and uh, uh, President Yu of Korea Foundation, which is a good um, preparation for our discussion. Um, we have six uh, very distinguished presenters and panelists this morning uh, who would like to talk about three um, questions in my view. Um, who are the middle powers? Uh, what is the definition of middle power? And what can they do? Uh, how do we exercise this public diplomacy for the public common good? Uh, these are the main questions that we have in mind to proceed uh, with our discussion this morning. Uh, let me introduce four presenters, distinguished presenters, and two panelists. Um, first, we have Dr. Cha Duhyun, Dr. Cha, on my left here, um, who is the executive vice president of Korea Foundation. Uh, and he was also research fellow at Korea Institute of Defense Analysis for more than 20 years. And his area of specialty um, is national defense, security, uh, and also North Korean studies. And, and in his capacity as a security specialist, he has been um, engaged in many research activities on public diplomacy. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Cha Duhyun, please give him a big uh, round of applause. <clears throat> um, and we have, uh, if I can introduce all the presenters, um, Professor Eitan Gilboa um, from Israel, from the Middle East, who is a professor at the School of Communication uh, at Bar Ilan University. And he is a renowned expert on international communication and public diplomacy. Uh, he has been teaching at the university for a long time, and he was a director of the School of Communication and also Center for International uh, Communication uh, as well. Uh, he's also a visiting professor of public diplomacy at the University of Southern California, USC, where he helped to establish the Center on Public Diplomacy. So uh, we have Professor Eitan Gilboa. Would you like to give him a big round of applause? And and we have the incumbent ambassador uh, from Australia, who has recently arrived in Korea to serve uh, as an ambassador from uh, Australia. Um, he has been responsible for. Uh, working on counterterrorism and international strategic and security uh, policy and political and military affairs, intelligence and regional issues in the Australian government. Uh, he was ambassador to Thailand previously uh, and also he led Australia's disaster relief uh, response to the 2004 uh, Asian tsunami. So um, we have Ambassador William Patterson, ladies and gentlemen, William Patterson. Uh, and then we have another distinguished um, presenter from Asia, uh, this time Indonesia. Um, Rizal Sukma uh, is executive director of the CSIS, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in Jakarta. Um, uh, Rizal Sukma is uh, chairman of International uh, Relations uh, and also member of the Board of Advisors of the Institute for Peace and Democracy. Um, and he studied in London, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and has worked extensively on uh, many issues such as uh, security in Southeast Asia, ASEAN affairs, the Indonesian foreign and um, defense policy and military reform, uh, and so on. So, Brizal Sukma, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, personally, I had a very good uh, conversation with him in Jakarta this year um, by attending the CSIS seminar on Korea-Indonesian partnership, and uh, I would like to tell you it was a very uh, important, productive discussion. 
Uh, and we have two um, prominent uh, scholars uh, and practitioners. Uh, we have Secretary General of the Danish Cultural uh, Institute, uh, whose name is Mr. Finn Anderson. Uh, Mr. Finn Anderson has been Secretary General of the Danish Cultural Institute in Copenhagen. Uh, and before, he was country director of the Danish Cultural Institute in Britain and Ireland, uh, based in Edinburgh. Uh, and also, he has been uh, external examiner at the universities and business schools uh, in Denmark. Uh, he was also an adjunct professor in international studies at Aalborg University. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Finn Anderson. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Professor Philip Zip, uh, who is a professor of journalism and public diplomacy at the University of uh, Southern uh, California. Uh, he was a director uh, of the Center on Public uh, Diplomacy, uh, which, as I have mentioned, Professor Eitan Gilboa has contributed to establish uh, the center. So I know, I guess, two of you might be very good friends uh, with each other, working in the same area. Um, Professor Philip Zip uh, has uh, uh, written uh, many books, including Headline Diplomacy regarding the media, the role of media in international relations, which affect foreign policy, uh, and also um, the, uh, the Middle Eastern Media Communication Group, as you know, Al Jazeera, the effect uh, of this Al Jazeera on the uh, global issues, global terrorism, and the new media, uh, and so on. So we have Professor Philip Zip, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I have got two hours and five minutes, so I'd like to use it very efficiently uh, by starting uh, with uh, Professor Dr. Cha's uh, presentation on the role of middle power in public diplomacy. Dr. Cha. Thank you, Honorable Dr. Pa. Uh, before starting my presentation, uh, I would like to say it's my great privilege and honor uh, to meet and discuss with uh, such a prominent and distinguished uh, experts and practitioners and scholars uh, on the issue of middle power's law of public diplomacy. Uh, the main point uh, of my presentation is middle power uh, can uh, take a law of a bridge that link people to people, culture to culture, uh, as well as the government to government, state to state, uh, through a loose but very collaborative network, uh, like that of gentleman's club. Someone say that, why this time the law of middle powers uh, should be emerged, and how, what should or can they do that? Uh, for that reason, uh, I would like to refer to uh, the fact that uh, transforming world and power tra transitions in the 21st century. As all of us know, um, there took place uh, three major trends, information, uh, informationization, globalization, and the democratization um, had taken place, and they have inevitably in induced a power transition from government to civil society and from state and the Westphalian sovereignty to global and local network of knowledge and from hot power to soft power. In this circumstance, a single husband of balance of power system cannot manage all of the complex and difficult issues that need to be resolved. So, Countries have to find the method of survival and the prosperity in a more collaborative and cooperative manner rather than contending national interests. We also uh, have to refer to the fact that there, is, uh, there are so many common issues to resolve and the emerging threats beyond the boundaries. We have many global issues that remain unresolved despite is uh, their enormous if efforts. As time progresses, they will only increase. Most of them demand internationally collaborative assessment and countermeasures. Uh, for example, there are some, uh, we are all 
the same uh, interest, and uh, we have share uh, we, we share the similar uh, goal for uh, for handling the global financial crisis and the establishment of global governance system and the world sustainable diplomacy. Uh, sustainable de development. We should also be concerned about emerging issues that need cooperative and common approaches among countries, such as urbanization, migration, and the multicultural society, uh, acceleration of an aging society, cybersecurity, and generation gap, and so on. So countries also have to take into account transnational and the non-traditional non uh, non threats, uh, such as narco tra trafficking and the international crime, weaponization of resources, and threat to major sea rains that have emerged since the end of the 20th century that are especially, that are, but now, especially prominent. Despite these many emerging issues, Initiating cooperative approaches among superpowers is not so easy because of deep-rooted distrust and heterogeneity while avoiding direct conflict. It has been also difficult to initiate collaboration between superpowers and smaller powers. As, you, as all of us know, there are so many different viewpoint, viewpoints on various issues that are difficult to compromise such as origin, related responsibility, level of contribution, and so on. So, the need for bridging the gap between the superpowers and the weaker countries is uh, becoming more and more important. Uh, and then, I would like to point out that what's the uh, typical way or behavior that or oh, the should, uh, middle powers should take. We should go beyond the traditional definition of public diplomacy based on the national interest. Although there is no agreed definition on the term of middle power, we can identify the common or popular credos, credos of middle powers. It's not seeking hegemony and advocating multilateral cooperation rather than competition among groups or blocks, pursuing consensus of collaboration rather than unilateral or majority decision or coercion. And middle powers also should emphasize international, regional norms and morality, and have to promote creativity rather than maintaining conventional wisdom. If middle powers can take truly meaningful roles in international relations, they should consider continuous um, evolution, such as refraining from seeking short-term selfish national interest, or obtaining the trust of weaker powers as a role model, as well as from super uh, trust of superpowers uh, as a minor uh, as a mirror of morality. Superpowers also can establish exemplary political, economical, and social system, and think and act beyond the territorial borders. Through all of these efforts, middle powers can expand cooperation with the civil societies, not only at the domestic level, but also regional and international level. In this regard, the concept of public diplomacy among middle powers should be differentiated from that of superpowers or uh, major powers. The, middle, uh, the public diplomacy of middle power countries should not merely aim for exclusive privilege or brand powers, but realize a need for a common good. And the public diplomacy of middle power should, allow, uh, should be allowed 
sympathy uh, should should allow sympathy among nations and peoples rather than coercing others, so to speak, trying not to take on the mask of a superpower. I don't say that middle powers is free from the national interest. There is no country that can do that. But in a short term, the emphasis on the public diplomacy, not for the national interest, but for the public goods or international goods, is not, is not oh, in the short term, it is not so beneficial. But in medium and long term, the reputation oh, and the trust of other countries and the brand images of that country can sharply increase. Yes, while thinking others, they also can, can think themselves. Oh, and the middle powers, oh, public diplomacy can be a channel for mutual understanding and trust among them as well as with other powers. Through the cooperation in public diplomacy, middle powers will be able to expand the shared values that are common morality and ultimately establish a world court of common sense. And the middle power countries can uh, act cooperatively in agenda setting, effort, agenda setting uh, in the international issues. It does not mean uh, uh, it does not mean that the middle powers make another exclusive group or uh, that have seek their own selfish interest. But they have to make a network for cooperation and collaboration and then promoting the uh, cooperation among all the global countries. Finally, I would like to say how we can build an architecture for sustainable cooperation. For enhancing and expanding the cooperation in public diplomacy among middle powers, we need to establish a network for, con uh, network, uh, for continuous deliberation. It's not necessarily government, uh, government uh, level meeting. Oh, it's sufficient uh, in an initial stage, 1.5 or two track dialogues and subsequent networking. And for continuous cooperation, uh, we also uh, have, we also try to uh, cooperation, uh, cooperate with distinguished public organizations or NGOs. NGOs. Uh, in the case of the Korea Foundation, we have made various efforts toward networking by already launching the Korean Network for International Exchange in October of this year for domestic cooperation and collaboration. And this Korea Foundation Global Seminar, we think, uh, will be a starting point for such networking at the international level. And I propose we can start with corporate countries first. We are gathering all of the middle powers together in the initial stage is neither possible nor desirable. The middle powers that share visions and values can make a small groups of colleagues. This principle can be applied in cooperation or oh, in various fields and various activities. But as I already mentioned, we are not pursued a closed and exclusive membership. Basically, this type of network or mechanism will be open to all the middle powers that can share the uh, values and the moral and the goals. So, uh, we 
is sufficient to the lose uh, network, lose but corporate network uh, among the middle powers that has a capability, willingness, and existence of uh, existence of vision. I do believe that at the starting point, it is a merely a small building block. But in the long run, it can be a great skyscraper to read the peaceful, to lead toward the more peaceful and the collaborative world. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Cha. Or thank you for providing us with uh, some food for thought uh, about middle power and the public diplomacy. Um, Dr. Cha has pointed out that public diplomacy will be exercised beyond national borders through multilateral cooperation, working with civil societies, and to pursue sustainable cooperation. And he uh, made an example of MITCA, the five country informal um, consul consultative uh, group, which is open, as open membership and low threshold. Um, so uh, let me move to um, the next presenter, who is from the Middle East, Israel. Uh, I'll give you 10 minutes, as I have given to Dr. Cha. Uh, after 10 minutes, my glass bell will ring. Um, so, Professor Eitan Gilboa. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Korean Foundation for the invitation to participate in this uh, conference. This is my second appearance uh, for the Korean Foundation, and I'm very happy to be here. I would like to praise the Korean Foundation for conducting this conference. I'm doing research on comparative public diplomacy and I'm very interested in ways countries evaluate their existing programs and plan future ones. And I think this is one of the best models of doing both evaluation uh, and uh, planning. I also would like to recognize here the presence of Ambassador Ma, a brilliant public diplomacy uh, expert who is doing a great job for Korea. Uh, I am a theoretician of public diplomacy, but in this particular area, you cannot uh, develop theory without sufficient evidence from the field itself, and therefore I am very interested in, in practice as well. There are many questions about the usefulness of the concept uh, middle power. And I have uh, wasted a few months of researching it, and I've written an article where I'm spending a few pages thus just about, about the term. Uh, what we can say, or what I'm saying about middle powers is this. Number one, uh, middle powers usually have much more influence than their resources. And secondly, perhaps from a negative perspective, Middle powers force the superpowers to do things that otherwise they would not do. So we have the combination of these two types of influences. Um, this, is a, this is a typical uh, graphic description of what uh, a middle power could be. This is uh, the Cold War. You see Kennedy versus Khrushchev, and here on the right, you see Canadian foreign, uh, foreign minister at the time, John Diffenbaker, uh, with the UN flag trying to separate them apart. Um, these are the theoretical issues that we need to discuss why successful public diplomacy is critical for middle powers. Is the public diplomacy of middle powers different from that of superpowers and states? How middle powers contribute to public diplomacy theory and practice? I have only a few minutes, so I'll be uh, touching, only touching on those issues. My uh, main argument is this. As I said earlier, middle powers, limited resources, much more influence in international relations. I think that to be a middle power, 
you need substantial soft power assets. And effective utilization of public diplomacy based on those soft power assets. I'm arguing that often the difference between being a middle power and just a regular state is public diplomacy. This makes the difference between uh, uh, middle powers and perhaps other states. What is power in the information age? Nation's capacity to create and manipulate knowledge and information. We talk today about three kinds of uh, power, hard power, everybody knows that, soft power, and smart power. But smart power, what is smart power? Smart power is not just the integration of hard power and soft power, which many people uh, refer to. It's an integration of those two types of power so that they effectively advance effectively advance the actor's goals via mutual reinforcing. That's, that's the basic idea here. What is the nature of power? It's always, always comparative. It's you and somebody else. It's always relative because you can be stronger from one country and weaker from another. And it's always perceived it in the mind of people rather than, than anything else. So you can see here on the right. What is the middle? We know superpowers, and we know, we know states, and even failed states. So it's in between. So uh, typical uh, definition, tr uh, trivial definition is this. A middle, I'm quoting from someone. A middle power is a state that is neither a great power, not a small power. Well, you know, you could have uh, uh, a wide range of countries in between. So this is not a satisfactory definition. But so we need, in order to know the middle, we need to know the high category and also the low category. And this is, a, this is certainly not an easy thing to do. Uh, this is an attempt to uh, calculate hard power. I cannot go into this in, in details, but if you apply this formulation, which was developed many years ago by the CIA uh, by, uh, by, the name of, uh, by a person by the name of Ray Klein. You have hard, hard elements on the left, such as territory and population and GDP and conventional versus nuclear materials. But then uh, you multiply it by soft elements. Here we have like soft elements, strategic power and will. This was added after Vietnam, strategic power and will. But you see, here you give values from 1 to 10, here only from 0, 0.0 to 1.0. So in the past, you, if you were to apply this formula, you will get, you will get a number of states uh, in, in the middle, but we know that today this is not a good uh, formula. Um, what we can say about middle powers in terms of theory, number one, they have to lead. They have to lead something. They cannot be just behind, although I'm hearing that Obama is leading behind. I don't know what is to lead behind. Either you lead or you are behind. So you have to lead. So this is, this is one element. Second, you have to have assets, mostly soft power assets. Third, you deal with certain issues that are more useful and more interesting for middle powers. And third, you always do it in with partners. Only the superpowers, and even today, this not may be true, only superpowers can do whatever they want. And it turns out that even for the United States, the greatest superpower, this might not be possible in many situations. But for middle powers, you always have to work together with other. In terms of assets, Joe Nye, who, invade, who invented uh, soft power, said, talked about institutions, values, culture, and foreign policy. That's not enough. So I think that uh, here we have an attempt by the London Institute for Government. They suggest to look at uh, five different categories of soft power, assets, business, culture, government, diplomacy, and education. We can also see, this is another attempt by Simon Anholt 
who invented the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, nation branding. We see similar categories here, uh, people, tourism, exports, governance, investment and in immigration, culture and heritage. All these are categories of soft power. Incidentally, this is, uh, this is for 2012. Uh, they uh, calculated soft power assets for 30 countries. Uh, Korea is number 14. And over time, the position of Korea has been improving. I cannot go into details. I have reservations about it. But this is an attempt to calculate soft power assets and rank order different countries. Uh, this is another attempt uh, to, do, to do a soft power index. Uh, it's from zero to one. Uh, it's based on public opinion polls. And, and you can see South Korea is on, on the right, uh, which shows that it has the most respect in Vietnam of some places, of, of all places. And the next place is, is China. So this is evaluation of soft power assets as seen by other countries. So this is, this is nation branding for Korea. And if you look at it, then the question is, what is the essence of nation branding for Korea? What you see here is, is like a big mix that has to be, that has to be focused on, on some specific area. The issues that middle powers are dealing with, uh, we, we here we uh, distinguish among three uh, types of agenda. First agenda, world security. For middle powers, with the exception of conflict resolution and peace peacekeeping forces. Uh, the second is economic <coughs> development and foreign aid. Typical issue for middle powers. This is where they have to distinguish, distinguish themselves from other countries. And the third agenda, human rights, human security, human rights, climate change, and health. These are the issues which middle powers uh, work on. When we manage public diplomacy, we have to look at the following uh, issues. We need to look at challenges, strategies, priorities, contents, instruments, programs, coordination, supervision, feedback, and evaluation. For middle powers, this formula, which I have developed for planning purposes, is critical. Because if the purpose is to be a middle power, a certain uh, answer must be given to all of these planning issues. These are, this is my own instrumental approach to public diplomacy. I've identified, like, I think, uh, 15 different instruments of public diplomacy. All of them uh, are being pursued by middle powers with diff diff some, some different, uh, different uh, emphasis. Uh, but for me, in order for public diplomacy program to be efficient, especially for middle powers, there must be a need to consider all of these all of these instruments uh, in, in a one strategic plan. And public diplomacy for me, it's not just cultural diplomacy. It's much more than that, as you can see, with the different uh, instruments here. My time is up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Eitan Gilboa. Thank you for being very punctual. I almost tried to ring my bell, but uh, uh, you just wound up. Um, th this is a very interesting presentation. In my view, uh, you have elaborated on the components of the middle power diplomacy uh, and the different approaches, uh, including the complex equation uh, about what constitutes middle power. Um, I think one of the most important points that Professor uh, Eitan Gilboa uh, has pointed out is that the middle power requires leadership assets, issues, and partners. Now, certainly, I think these are very important uh, element of exercising middle power. Um, you mentioned nation branding, and Korea has always been known as a land of the morning come. And that was the name of our nation, but now it's a dynamic Korea. So people say, we are the nation land of the morning busy and evening crazy. Um, so let me move on to the third presenter. Ambassador William Patterson from Australia. Ambassador. Well, 
thank you, Chairman, uh, Chairman Park, uh, and thank you to the Korea Foundation for doing me the honor of uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I propose to, uh, in contrast to, to the professor's uh, presentation, to offer a governmental approach to middle power collaboration with other middle powers. Uh, some of my colleagues from Canberra who are responsible for the development of our middle power policy are here with me today. Uh, I haven't cleared what I'm going to say with them, but they'll be staying on to correct me after, after I've left. Um, I've noticed reading some of the literature since I've been in Korea that middle power status has been something of a preoccupation for some in Korea and indeed for other self-described middle powers for some years. And, uh, but today I wanted to address the evolution of a middle power consultative forum. MICTA, which has only recently just held its first meeting. But perhaps to go back quickly, what constitutes a middle power? Let me just offer some non-prescriptive thoughts. I think, uh, obviously, economic weight. Political power, I think, derives from a combination, of course, of soft power, as the Professor mentioned, but also from economic and military substance and deriving from that capability. Uh, middle power status also in, in involves a readiness to engage internationally and actively to lead in support both of national interests but also issues related to global order. It also, I think, requires membership, membership of, but more importantly, contribution to, not only the UN, the WTO and other regional and multilateral bodies. It requires, to be credible, I think, values and institutions underpinning this, which lend credibility uh, to advocacy and present attractive models, uh, what, what Professor might describe as soft power assets. Normally, it, uh, middle power status would probably require, I think, to, uh, liberal and open societies and to be probably significant trading nations. National capability, has to be there, political leadership, diplomatic skills and a diplomatic network if, if this is to be used internationally. Why do both Australia and Korea fit into that? I think both countries meet all those criteria. In terms of GDP, Australia ranks 12th in the world and, the, and Korea ranks 15th. Both countries are active, uh, for instance, as providers of development assistance and both contribute to UN peacekeeping operations. Both are members of the G20, the OECD, APEC, EAS, and are partners right here in Korea in the Global Green Growth Institute. Both are currently non-permanent members of the United Nations Security Council because they want to make a broader international contribution. We share broad areas of agreement across the international agenda things like a commitment to, to nuclear nonproliferation and to disarmament, to human rights and to a rules-based international order. We have always been out there active. We conceived APEC and the Cairns Group. We were in instrumental in the Cambodia peace settlement and the birth of Timor-Leste, Timor practical and constructive middle power activity. Both Australia and Korea are active in the East Asia Summit process and APEC, but with key national interests and engagement that extend to the Middle East and beyond. But neither of us has a natural constituency such as the EU or ASEAN to support us. And finally, I think both of us are attractive soft power and smart power models, but in quite different ways. I might just talk a little bit about the thinking behind the pivotal powers or middle powers initiative. What sort of principles? Why, 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 is this, why has the time come for such a grouping? Well, the international order is changing. We're living in a period of great flux. Power centres have become more numerous and more diffuse. There are new consequential players like China, India and Brazil gaining increasing power and authority, while many established powers, the US, EU and Japan, are experiencing extended periods of slower growth. And non-state actors, as well as cross-border impacts of uh, uh, information technology, have also impacted on the roles of nation states. So the picture is changing very rapidly. 
regional powers like Australia, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, Mexico and Turkey are also gaining new prominence. We believe amongst those, group, that, those ones I've just listed, there are some shared interests and challenges. Our, our, our interests are converging. We share a common experience of navigating between our strong relationships with the established powers and our growing and economic, economic and trade ties to the emerging major powers. We face similar challenges, many of them new and requiring new ways of thinking, promoting the stability and prosperity of our regions and tackling global issues, including climate change and non-traditional security problems, transnational crime, unregulated people movements, food and energy security and cyber security. And we share, as I said earlier, a core interest in safeguarding a predictable rules-based international order and promoting constructive multilateral activity. So a global approach is essential to tackling many of the challenges we face, but the international environment uh, at the same time is becoming more contested. The practices and principles underpinning the international order are coming under challenge. It's becoming harder to achieve results through multilateralism. Effective multilateral organisations also ensure smaller states and middle powers like Australia and Korea retain a strong voice on issues that matter to us and provide an opportunity for established and emerging powers to come together to resolve differences in a constructive way. We can benefit from consulting more as a group, we believe, leveraging our economic complementarities and our shared strategic interests. We can discuss ways to strengthen regional institutions and multilateral organisations like, like the UN, uh, particularly the UN Security Council, the G20, the WTO, and to use our established relationships with, uh, with uh, 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 the bigger powers and emerging powers and a reputation as honest brokers to help build consensus with these organisations. We believe in this MICTA group that, we've, that has now had its first meeting, uh, a, a rather ideal combination uh, where we're, which we're approaching with a spirit of inclusiveness. It is not our intention, uh, nor that I think of any of the other participants in this group, to create an exclusive non-G7, non-BRICS block. This would create an unhelpful dynamic. We should not aim uh, to agree joint positions necessarily in advance of international forums but, but our aim is to share ideas, to identify innovative solutions to existing challenges we should support and, if that's the case, we should promote through our own regional and international networks. It is there, I think, that we can take this process beyond what uh, my colleague uh, Rizal Sukma described, I think, in the Jakarta Post, as take this process beyond chit-chat. We should aim to build this in an incremental manner, taking a gradual approach to build confidence among the participants and to reassure other states about the constructive and inclusive nature of this initiative. Well, the five foreign ministers of Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and Australia carried this forward and met on the margins for the first time as a group uh, met on the margins of the UN in New York on 26 September. They agreed they should aim to have regular informal meetings between uh, middle powers foreign ministers. And the format of the meeting should continue to be informal, something like a lunch or dinner discussion, a meeting on the side of another, another meeting to create the right environment for an informal and free exchange of views. What should they discuss? Some broad topics could be proposed. Uh, I think broad themes uh, might be the role of middle powers in promoting multilateralism, uh, the working methods of the United Nations Security Council. Are there better ways to be doing things? Uh, but, but within a framework of supporting the UN and embedding the G20 in international architecture. As you know, Australia will host the G20 in Australia next year. Korea, of course, hosted it here in 2010. Our aim should be to support 
regional stability and prosperity uh, through closing development gaps and enhancing the effectiveness of regional institutions. The group might also look at ways in which we could, we could catalyse uh, work on global challenges like building a consensus on approaches to climate change, non-traditional security problems, as I mentioned before, such as the, tr the whole transnational crime agenda would be one area. Also food security and, importantly, cyber security. Foreign ministers uh, m may develop over time some broad principles for middle power cooperation, how, in fact, uh, their considerable joint persuasive power can best be deployed. They could agree on next steps to carry this forward and either separately or jointly pursue them in other forums. In the shortage of time, I might, uh, might just uh, move on to say that we don't see this as an exclusive block. Australia sees this as a flexible mechanism and one that w we certainly would be open to including other countries in this initiative in the future where they're like-minded and where they would add value. But process and membership really are less important than common approaches and demonstrating value. But, uh, but the MICTA group, I think, uh, has shown a commonality of view, a commonality of purpose, and, and in fact the right people at the right time to carry this forward. But the idea of including others in discussions on particular issues has been raised and we certainly see merit in this as a way of building consensus around solutions to particular challenges and emphasising uh, the inclusive nature of this initiative. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador, <coughs> for uh, explaining the uh, process of the middle power diplomacy, which is now in evolving <clears throat> process, and also pointing out the complementary nature of the membership uh, in the MITCA, uh, which is an open and inclusive uh, framework, and playing its role in multilateral diplomacy like the UN Security Council and transnational issues in cybersecurity as well. Um, we have two plus two uh, process going on between Korea uh, and Australia, in addition to Korea-US uh, 2 plus 2 process. So the cooperation between the two countries uh, is making increasingly uh, productive uh, result. Uh, next, we turn to uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, who is a president of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Dr. Sukma. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude you know, to the Korea Foundation for the invitation so I can uh, share my thought you know, on these uh, uh, issues of middle powers and also the public diplomacy. And I'm also uh, 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 grateful you know, to the organizer for putting me next to Ambassador Peterson. It's nice to sit to Australian ambassador you know, during this difficult time uh, in Indonesia-Australia relationships uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, spying uh, allegations you know, and so on. Uh, anyway, I will not uh, try to engage you know, in this academic debate you know, on what middle powers is, who are middle powers, who are not, because it's very difficult, you know, because countries like Indonesia, you know, probably in terms of size, you know, both in uh, uh, the, 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 the territory and also the population, we are really big, you know, 250 million, and then I think we do have like 2.1 you know, million kilometers. You know, but of course, you know, our influence is less than Singapore, you know, which is actually very small in terms of you know, geography and uh, territory and also uh, population. So it's, it's, it's actually it's quite a relative you know, concept. But nevertheless, you know, I think uh, we, we, you know, we can uh, look at this, this issue uh, from uh, a more, I think, you know, behavioral you know, approach. And I think uh, Professor Gilbois you know, has written a lot you know, on this. So please refer to uh, his articles and his uh, uh, papers you know, for uh, this uh, debate you know, about the uh, middle power status and the qualities and elements you know, of that middle power. Uh, but I think uh, all the definitions and all discussions about the middle powers agree that middle powers do have you know, a limit, either in terms of you know, the uh, resources, uh, capacity, and also in terms of the uh, global outreach. And because of that, I think it is absolutely necessary for a middle power, no matter how you define it, you know, to actually you know, focus you know, on certain uh, uh, global or international issues you know, before uh, they uh, embark on a certain diplomatic initiative in order to advance or promote you know, certain uh, 
uh, uh, issues, you know, which I think, uh, uh, I think uh, 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 some of us already uh, alluded to the fact that you know those issues that middle powers want to advance actually those issues that might have high moral standings, so it can actually uh, uh, gain legitimacy, legitimacy you know, in the eyes of the uh, international community. So uh, uh, that's, you know, I think is a very important fact that we have to keep in mind, you know, before we uh, uh, discuss about what sort of the public diplomacy uh, strategy that these middle powers, you know, should uh, undertake. So, but, you know, it, it, in, in that context, you know, the limits of middle powers, both in terms of resources, capacity, and also the global outreach, you know, I think uh, I would like to quote, you know, Professor Gilbois again about the importance of public diplomacy, because public diplomacy does provide an opportunity, you know, for middle powers to actually exercise a degree of influence at the international stage. And within that context, you know, I think the public diplomacy of middle powers need to be aimed at a number of, of you know, uh, uh, objectives. Number one, of course, uh, uh, the middle powers, uh, in order to you know uh, promote a certain global agenda, need you know to engage in a coalition building. Uh, we all agree that you know even superpower cannot actually do it alone. So middle powers you know need to uh, engage in a coalition building uh, among themselves you know in order to advance a particular uh, cause you know in the international arena. Uh, second, uh, related to that one, you know the public diplomacy should also be aimed at uh, 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 gaining you know a global support or international support. Uh, for the issues that you know they are working on, and third, I think it's also important for some countries. Uh, the public diplomacy should not forget that the audience is not only out there, but it's also within you know the national constituencies themselves. So uh, public diplomacy should be also aimed at you know uh, forging the domestic support and domestic uh, acceptance of the status of uh, middle power or uh, the agendas that they want you know to promote. And fourth, and uh, it's important also, you know, for the middle powers uh, to uh, attract non-state actors' participation uh, and engagement, you know, in their you know, undertaking, in their uh, initiative, you know, to promote uh, selected uh, uh, issues of the global uh, concern. So, in order for middle powers to achieve this uh, objective of the public diplomacy, you know, I think uh, uh, there are a number of qualities, you know, that you know uh, it, it, it needs to have. Number one. Uh, it needs to have uh, middle power needs to have the convening power, you know, the ability you know, to actually uh, 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 be a champion, you know, in order you know to uh, uh, promote a certain or put a certain agenda on the international table. Uh, this ability, is, I think, is also related to the ability you know to exercise a degree of uh, regional uh, uh, leadership, you know, so that you know it, it does you know have this capacity you know of putting uh, a global agenda on the table. Uh, the second uh, quality that middle powers need to have, it should be a democracy. And without democracy, you can't actually, you know, be open to the ideas that you need to, you know, to be inclusive, you know, in bringing all the non-state actors in, you know, working together with the uh, CSOs or the NGOs, you know, and so on. So without being a democracy, it would be difficult, in my view, actually, you know, to gain legitimacy, you know, for middle powers that certain issue does require, you know, domestic support, you know, because in, in a non-democracy, uh, non-state actors are not important, you know, they're just, you know, a nuisance, especially the CSO and the NGOs. Number three, uh, middle power need to be committed, you know, to the uh, principles of tra transparency. You know, because whatever initiative that you take at the global arena, actually you are using the public money, you know, for uh, uh, promoting those uh, uh, agenda. So you need to be transparent, you know, actually on how you do it, why you do it, you know, on what issues uh, or what objective that you need to uh, uh, attain, you know, in, in, in actually promoting the certain agenda. Number four, a middle power, you know, should also have the ability to sustain whatever initiative that they embark on. So because, as I mentioned uh, in my, my piece, which uh, Ambassador Peterson nicely quoted, actually, this, uh, in his presentation, that, you know, you should go, actually, beyond the chit-chat. So it should not be only, you know, a, 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 a con press conference, you know, in the sideline of the UN. So it should be, you know, uh, sustainable. It, it should uh, actually have that, that quality, you know, so the ability to sustain uh, efforts uh, that uh, you uh, begin to take. And, and finally, you know, I think uh, it should prioritize uh, uh, collective actions. And we all agree on this. I think uh, the, the multilateral the character of the middle powers, you know, is, is, is a very uh, self-evident, you know, because, you know, the preference uh, to, uh, to the multilateralism, you know, I think is important uh, qualities or uh, elements of, of a middle power. Now, uh, let me briefly turn to the uh, hottest issue, I think, in Seoul and also in a number of uh, 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 countries, the MIGTA. Uh, uh, here, uh, if you look at the MIGTA and also the, uh, 
uh, the, 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 the some kind of joint uh, uh, con uh, press conference or statement issued by the foreign ministers, you know, it does actually refer to a number of qualities that I just mentioned. It's actually democracies, all these countries' democracies. And so actually, I think it's also important to uh, 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 take a note that uh, these five countries are also members of the G20. So this, I think, you know, provide MICTA as a very strong platform, you know, for uh, uh, informal uh, and <coughs> uh, corporations among the middle powers. But it does have at least three challenges uh, so that you can actually uh, 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 be, you know, be sustained. I think the first challenge is uh, to ensure uh, there is a domestic, you know, acceptance of this initiative. Uh, there is a very interesting debate going on in, in Canberra and also in Jakarta. You know, in Canberra, I think the debate is whether you know, Australia is a middle power or not. I think it's the, it's the same debate is also taking, going on you know, in, in, in Jakarta. I mean, people in Jakarta, especially if you tell them that Indonesia is a middle power, they get very upset you know, because they only think in terms of size you know, and also in terms of number of populations. So because Indonesians tend to see themselves as a big country, uh, this is the new... Uh, is a new concept, you know, big country. You know, it's not big power, but you know, it's hard to accept that you know your country is actually a you know, middle kind of you know status. Uh, we love to see ourselves as not as middle power, but more in terms of power in the middle. You know, so that's I think there is a nuance, you know, in that uh, uh, self perception of, of of the country. Uh, in, in in Canberra, you know, I think a number of my colleagues, and I think it's also I must say this, uh, your friends, uh, Anthony Bergens, you know, and others, they have this debate. Uh, whether Australia is a middle power or not. Uh, Anthony Bergen actually referred to the fact that in South Pacific, Australia is definitely a superpower. Uh, so it's again, you know, it, it reveals the nature of the uh, concept as a relative you know, concept. The second uh, challenge, the questions of relevance. You know, does MICTA really relevant? You know, is MICTA really relevant you know, to the uh, 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 global public goods that you know, we are talking about you know, in, this, you know, in this conference? Uh, so that's, you know, I think, uh, you know, we need to go beyond the convening power, you know, in order to follow up, you know, all the uh, 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 pledges and also promises that this MICTA already uh, agreed among themselves. Number three, it should be inclusive. I agree. You know, again, you know, we will have this debate, you know, who should be included and who should, you know, be kept out of this, you know, grouping. Uh, this is, uh, but uh, when, when, when we talk about inclusivity, you know, within the MICTA, it should refer, you know, to the ability of this grouping to engage non-state actors, the academia, the media, CSOs, NGOs, you know, into the, uh, you know, into the process, into the uh, grouping. So because I do believe that uh, the, the, the success you know, of uh, middle powers uh, public diplomacy really depend on the engagement and also participation by the CSO. Uh, and I think that's uh, where the network also you know, comes in. Uh, the fourth challenge, uh, how to build and strengthen the synergy you know, for the collective you know, actions. Uh, I do believe that because South Korea is actually the convener, you know, of this uh, uh, MICTA, and then they will, you know, uh, uh, do, you know, I think uh, the best, you know, to ensure that this is not going to be, you know, only a product of chit chat among the five foreign ministers in New York at the sideline of the UN you know, General Assembly meeting. You know, you know, in that context, you know, we do need to look at the challenges that we face in terms of uh, strengthening the synergy and uh, four collective actions, and that require all these five countries, you know, to connect the dots. Uh, here, you know, I think we still have a problem. The relationship between Indonesia and South Korea is a very good, very strong. You know, so the dot is connected there. The relationship between Indonesia and Australia is also strong, but currently it's not very strong. It's also, you know, a problem how, you know, we maintain this dot between Indonesia and, and Australia. Australia, Korea, excellent. But I think, you know, it's not enough dots yet. You know, it's not really connected yet between Indonesia and Mexico or in, even Indonesia and, and Turkey. So that's, you know, I think without connecting those dots, which require a deepening and expansion of bilateral diplomatic ties, it would be difficult to imagine that MICTA can actually, you know, uh, undertake, you know, all this uh, agenda as a collective, you know, uh, entity. So because, you know, uh, as mentioned earlier, coalition, coalition building, uh, working together, you know, within that uh, multilateral platform is important, but you can't do it, you know, uh, 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 well unless, you know, all the dots among the participating uh, states is actually, you know, connected. So uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, in addition to the multilateralism, we should not forget that the bilateral dimensions of this, you know, uh, public diplomacy of the middle powers is also important. Final point, Mr. Moder uh, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> before you uh, 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 hit your uh, glass, I'm a realist, you know, so there is a limit to what these middle powers, you know, can do especially if we look at you know, the reality of the Asia-Pacific at the moment. 
at the end, you know, people will think that it's better to be, you know, a dragon rather than, you know, Hello Kitty. So that, that means that, you know, no matter what agenda that you want to advance, at the end, the success of that initiative will depend on the ability and the willingness of great powers such as China and also the United States, you know, to accept or to support, you know, those agenda. If not, it's going, you know, the, whatever agenda that you decide is going to be a nice agenda then, you know, to talk about among the middle powers, you know, without any, you know, a big prospect, you know, for the implementation and realizations. And in our region, in, in Asia Pacific, this challenge, I think, is harder now, you know, especially with the looming rivalry, you know, between the great powers, not only between the U.S. and China, but also between India and, and, and China, Japan and and. And, and, and China, uh, which I think, you know, require really a kind of regional architecture where middle powers can also maintain, you know, its centrality. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Rizal Sukma, for your excellent presentation uh, on the limitations of uh, middle power and the public diplomacy, um, and also um, the importance of um, securing domestic support uh, for the middle power uh, diplomacy. Um, and I think that uh, we have um, had all four presentations, uh, which were all very excellent. And we would like to move to uh, the panelist comment on the four uh, distinguished presenters. Uh, I would like to start with Dr. Finn Anderson, Secretary General of the Danish Cultural Institute. Dr. Anderson. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the four uh, introductions to the subjects. I think they were all very excellent, and uh, I also think I agree with most of what has been said, actually. Uh, I come from a very small country which uh, by size does not uh, qualify as a middle power. We are only five million people. But uh, I'm very uh, glad that uh, I've heard that resources are not the only qualification. You, you sometimes have more influence than you have resources. We have a Danish poet who is dead now, but he made a, a poem in English about the smallness of Denmark and the greatness of it. And it finished off by saying, we have no resources, we have no power, we have no how. So this is Danish modesty for you. Uh, but anyway, um, Denmark, uh, I think uh, I recognize uh, a lot of the things that have been said because uh, our influence internationally is certainly depending on, on all the alliances and all the networks and the multilateral cooperation, starting with the UN, where Denmark is very active, uh, the NATO alliance. Um, we are the uh, number one or, or two country giving the most uh, development aid uh, internationally, competing with another Scandinavian country. Um, we are supposed to be the happiest uh, people in the world, according to all the uh, surveys and so on. This is a big surprise to us every time, but it's 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 a very good uh, sort of publicity stunt, uh, which of course we accept. Um, there are a number of of Nordic uh, values and so on that that that, that are very popular at the moment. Uh, Danish television series about the crime and the Borgen and so on. So there are a number of, but. I'd like to start off with uh, Simon Anholt's um, uh, claim that the image of a country is by 90% a very fixed thing and it takes something un very unusual to change that, uh, certainly in the short run. And he gave me two examples once I, I talked to him and one was a positive example and one was a negative example. The positive one was when uh, Obama won the first election in America where after uh, a lot of adverse publicity uh, during the previous president, suddenly America became very popular overnight. Um, the question is how long that lasted. The negative thing was Denmark, and that's within, this was in connection with the cartoon crisis uh, in 2004-05 or something, uh, where one Danish newspaper not dictated by the government, as was believed in the Middle East, uh, published some 
in my opinion, fairly innocent cartoons, but they caused burnings of embassies and all sorts of things in, in the Middle East protests and nosediving of exports and so on. Uh, that's all picked up, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, again. So uh, things show that over time uh, you can be, uh, it can be changed. And I noticed that on this ranking, we have improved from the last one I saw from uh, number 15 to number 12 uh, in the world. But the point I'd like to make is about uh, nation branding, because we, we heard that Korea now is using dyna a dynamic uh, society as a, as a key word. Uh, in Europe, including Denmark, we've had innovation uh, as the key word. Uh, and my question is, how credible are these, uh, these slogans? I mean, one of Simon Anhot's main points is that unless you can actually prove and show uh, that the legitimacy of, of the slogan you're using, uh, it will have no or adverse effect. So I'm not uh, criticizing, I'm not disputing, but I'm asking, uh, is, uh, is this... A, a very good and well considered image that you can actually prove in in uh, in reality um, because I think uh, public diplomacy and credibility is is a very long term uh, process uh, and not one you leave to uh, commercial uh, advertising companies to coin. Uh, because then uh, you may uh, end up in trouble. If I may finish off by uh, mentioning the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs has four priorities which they highlight and which I hope, I would claim, uh, we can live up to. And the, th the four concerns is the environment, energy and climate as number one. We hosted the COP15 uh, uh, conference a few years ago and uh, it's very high on our agenda. Uh, I could show a slide, I don't know whether it's available, I gave it to the organizers, showing the Danish companies we highlight in connection with this, and they are to do with the windmills and energy saving and, and environmental protection and so on. The second uh, uh, issue is the Danish model, the social model, including democracy, flex security on the labor market and, and the way we treat each other. Uh, the third one is creative Denmark, our culture, uh, Danish design and so on, films and, and so on. And the fourth one is Denmark's global responsibility. Uh, we participate, as I mentioned, in development aid as well as in uh, wars in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. So uh, the policy has been very much that we try to work together with the big powers, America in, in, in question. And uh, when our prime minister visited uh, Obama a few months ago, um, uh, he also praised her uh, that she came from a country that was punching above its uh, weight. So we were very happy and, and proud about that, I think. So uh, my, my question perhaps that you might elaborate on is the issue of credibility and underlying values uh, behind uh, public diplomacy and nation branding. Well, thank you very much for your comment uh, and the thoughtful opinions on the presentation. Uh, let me turn to um, uh, Professor Philip Zip from um, University of Southern California. Professor Zip. Thank you very much. And first, I'd like to thank the uh, Korea Foundation. I'm honored to have been invited to participate. And I'd also particularly like to thank the young staff members of the Korea Foundation who are ubiquitous and helpful. And uh, they, they've taken care of me since I walked off the plane and I need to be taken care of. So that's very, that's very good. Uh, when Finn and I were talking about how we were going to respond to this, we, we sort of uh, decided we'd have a good cop, bad cop routine, and Finn's the good cop, I'm, I'm the bad cop, so I'm gonna try to stir things up a little bit. Um, first thing I wanna tackle, and, and this is just, uh, I'm partly doing this just to cause trouble, but partly also to, uh, to give you something to think about as we move through the day, is this whole notion of middle powers. 
the concept in itself is, is somewhat condescending. Actually, it sounds very American. I mean, that it's us and then the middle powers and the small powers and, and so on. And, and I think it is important, and, and I caught undertones of this in, in, the, in the presentations, uh, that, well, we're just middle powers, what can we do? I, I think that is, that is self-limiting in a way that, uh, that is unfortunate and unnecessary. And I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, if you look at in the area of water management and water conservation, and take two countries, the Netherlands and Singapore, these aren't middle powers, they're superpowers in that field. There, there, are, there are no countries that do it better. The United States brings people from Singapore and into its cities to help on water conservation matters. I mean, we don't, it's not a matter that these are a sort of second class public diplomacy entities. These are people who use their expertise to the best. The Netherlands, for example, of course, they deal with water every day. If they didn't understand water management, they'd be under the water. So they, they have to deal with that, and they do it very well, and they are respected around the world. It doesn't matter the size of their population, the size of their GDP, the size of their military. It is the size of their abilities that matters. And if we create these, what I would call, artificial distinctions uh, among nations, superpowers, middle powers, small powers. I think it's a distraction more than anything else. Now this afternoon when I do my, my formal presentation, I'm gonna be talking about um, this whole question of assertiveness in the context of Korean public diplomacy. And uh, I'll look forward to the discussion that we have after that. Um, I think uh, Mr. Sukma's point about, about regional power was, was particularly good because, see, there you can, it's, it's not the same sort of condescension. I mean, you're saying we can work within our region, there are certain levels of expertise, there are certain problems that have a geographical context to them, and we can respond to that. Um, and you say, I mean, you made the same point I was making, which is Indonesia doesn't like the middle status. I, I think you just, should just ignore it. And, and you don't refer to Indonesia as a middle power. I think this, this is kind of a game. Also this, uh, as Eitan has heard me say many times, I think, I think this whole branding and indexing stuff gets pretty close to nonsense. Um, if, you, if you focus on a brand, I mean, do you want to be a soft drink? Do you want to be Pepsi? Or do you want to do, some, or do, you want to be something else? You cannot divorce your global reputation and your global clout from policy. That's what matters. And I know of some countries in which they have put so much emphasis on trying to cultivate a brand, but it ignores the fact that people around the world today are pretty well informed if they want to be. And when they see this brand for a country and then they read on the internet or in a newspaper or something, something about a country that goes totally contrary to that, all that branding exercise has, has been worthless. I think that the countries, before they get into this, this notion of branding and paying consultants lots of money to come in and create a brand for them, or you can look at the various indexes, uh, I mean, they're, they're all over the place. The United States is number one, the United States is number 30. Eh, who cares? You know, it, it, just, it just doesn't matter. Again, it is a distraction. And what I'm going to point to again in this afternoon is the need to, as the American slogans, keep, the eye, keep your eye on the ball. Um, decide what it is you want to accomplish. Don't worry about labels. Don't be, worry about somebody else labeling you particularly, but decide what your national goals are. And remember this above all, and I, I don't want to preempt my afternoon talk, but the purpose of public diplomacy is to advance your national interest. It's not to be nice, it's not to win friends just so they're friendly, it's to advance your national interest. And sometimes that doesn't get, get, be, is not given enough thought. Uh, what do we really wanna get out of this? And once again, I think when we get so caught up in all these various labels we've been talking about, that can be a distraction from that. So there, I hope I've roiled the waters somewhat and uh, it can fuel some, some discussion. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, <clears throat> uh, Professor Philip Zip. Now we have <clears throat> 
four presentations and two comments. Um, so I would like to open the floor for questions and answers. But uh, before that, uh, let me ask this question to the presenters. Um, we don't agree uh, on all of the points that were uh, discussed today. Um, whether the term, the definition of middle pal uh, is um, very valuable or helpful concept in understanding and changing the international relations. Some countries think this is uh, too small, uh, condescending. Some countries think that this is not right, appropriate term. Uh, but whatever you call it, um, this is the fact that you know we have the superpower and non-superpower uh, and small powers as well. So the important thing is what kind of value addition we can make uh, to the international community for peace, stability, prosperity, uh, and safety, uh, either from poverty or disease or from the cyber attack, uh, some kind of value addition through the middle power uh, cooperation or coalition building. I think that's the main point that we are discussing now. Uh, let me ask my question to uh, Dr. Sukma and uh, Ambassador um, Patterson. Now, both of you mentioned MITCA, um, Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, Korea, and Australia as a kind of middle power uh, coalition, informal coalition. Uh, what would be the specific issue or issues that MITCA can concentrate on? All these five members, as you have pointed out, are members of the G20. The G20 um, has been working on a global financial stability and also closing the gap between the advanced and the developing countries in managing a financial crisis. Uh, what, what kind of value addition uh, do you foresee in the future activities uh, of MITCA? And would this framework, the informal five country framework, would grow into say six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Uh, or do you foresee MITCA as a kind of a sustainable uh, international coalition framework? Uh, which can provide productive uh, outcome for the better future of the world. Um, Dr. Sukma. Uh, thank you. Well, actually, this question should be you know, directed to Korea's foreign ministry, <laughs> the one you know, who took the initiative. Uh, because in Indonesia, the debate is not uh, resolved yet. You know, whether uh, 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 this uh, 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 grouping uh, can be uh, uh, useful. Uh, but. Uh, uh, let me make a couple of points on this you know, particular issue. First, uh, I think when we talk about middle powers, uh, regardless of the grouping of uh, MIGTA or non-MIGTA, uh, it, it, it refers not only to the uh, status uh, in terms of the ability to uh, uh, project its power, but I think it also uh, uh, reflects a, a particular role that country you know, wants to, you know, uh, to play. So if we define, uh, or at least you know, try to understand this middle power, uh, notions, you know, within the context of uh, a national role, uh, a, a role of country in national, international, you know, arena. I think uh, it, it will actually uh, uh, help us not to go into that debate, you know, whether you are small or big, or, or strong or weak. Uh, second point, uh, I do believe that uh, the MIGTA uh, uh, can actually be uh, uh, useful if, you know, if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, focus on. This, uh, connecting the dots, you know, among the you know the five countries first, and and then of course uh, it uh, should also uh, 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 identify the issues that uh, uh, they need you know to work on together. But of course, if you look at the qualities of these five countries, you know, democracy is one of the most important one. Uh, Turkey, you know, I think you know repeatedly you know mentioned that fact. Uh, South Korea's website, the foreign ministry, also mentioned that fact. Uh, I don't I don't find you know any reference to MIGTA in our foreign ministry's website yet. Uh, but, you know, so democracy building, you know, can be actually an important agenda, you know, how we can share our experience because, you know, within that, that can be implemented to our own respective regions. So in East Asia, you know, for example, we do uh, have Myanmar, for example, that requires a lot of support, you know, uh, in, you know, in this area. Number two, of course, the disaster response. And this is, you know, it's going to be, I think, uh, uh, number one, you know, challenge for many uh, countries in the years ahead. And, and, uh, and, and uh, the MIGTA member state, you know, do have experience and also, I think, the capacity to, you know, uh, uh, work on this, you know, particular, you know, issue. Thank you. Ambassador Patterson? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Park. Uh, I think the point was made uh, just at the end of the presentation is there that really the label was not important. The issue was uh, commonality of outlook and purpose. I don't think we're particularly we're, uh, struck by calling the group a middle power group. It's just that we found a group of roughly similar countries with whom we share a lot by way of commonality, commonality of outlook, commonality of purpose and capability to do something about it. Um, there's been a debate in Australia whether we should uh, call this, uh, this concept middle powers or pivotal powers. I think pivotal powers myself is, uh, we're, it's a bit premature. Uh, we could become pivotal powers, but we're not there yet. We've got to show we've actually achieved something if we're going to be, if, if we can claim to have been uh, pivotal. Um, part of the origin of putting together the group was, of course, came out of the G20. Australia has a strong commitment to the G20 because, well, we're included in it, and it has a has a huge capacity to shape uh, uh, the economic uh, framework amongst nations and to deal with economic crises but it could potentially go beyond that as well. Uh, however, uh, uh, we've, we've experienced in the UN Security Council uh, the way the big powers, if you like, the P5, tend to set the agenda, uh, and, 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 and we have to take what we're given. The, 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 the idea of a grouping of uh, slightly smaller states getting together is to ensure that our voice, our voice can be heard. So in part it's driven by that in the G20, it's driven by it in the UN. Our concern, as I mentioned, the shortcomings of multilateralism. The UN has now, whatever it is, 197 members. Very hard to get um, decisive outcomes, certainly out of the General Assembly and, and in, the, in the Security Council, and I think Korea and Australia are experiencing that as non-permanent members at the moment. Very hard for us uh, to... Uh, sort of stand in the way of the impetus coming from the P5. Uh, uh, in, in many cases, we don't want to stand in the way of it. We're, we're entirely supportive of it. But there'll be times when we really want our perspectives to be heard. Um, this is, I think the MICTA group really has got to produce some results. Uh, there's been some debate amongst, uh, 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 certainly one of the members of it is interested in sort of institutionalising it further setting up a secretariat, this kind of thing. I think that's not what we have in mind at all. We have in mind testing this out to see whether uh, this group of countries getting together can find common purpose and can deliver something, can value add something. If we don't, I think it'll simply fade away. Uh, obvious, uh, uh, certainly I know Korean Foreign Minister Yun raised this at the time of the Seoul Cyber Security Summit a few weeks ago, that cyber, might be one, cyber security might be one of those issues where the, the mem five members of this initial group have a shared outlook and shared concerns. Uh, I think uh, 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 Pat Rizal mentioned climate change and disaster response. Climate change is probably too big an issue for a grouping like this to really make uh, uh, much difference in a contested area of international public policy. But if you picked out an element of it, cooperation in disaster response, that might be, might be something to do. As somebody who's worked on aspects of transnational crime over, over recent years, I think that's an area potentially we could look at some further collaboration and, and advocate certain approaches uh, beyond the MICTA group itself. But, uh, you know, we've got to test it, we've got to see if it works and if it delivers results. And as I said, if it does, it'll strengthen and possibly bring in others on a topic-by-topic -topic basis. If it doesn't, it'll probably fade away. Well, thank you, Ambassador Patterson. Uh, Professor uh, Gilboa. I want to, to respond to Phil. Um, I have myself uh, many reservations about the term uh, middle power, uh, but I think it, it is still useful. Even if, even if we think it's not useful, uh, it is so widely used in practice that we have to deal with it. This is not an American term. It's an Asian term. It was first mentioned by Kautilya in India many centuries ago. I think it, today uh, we are using this term simply because of a void in, uh, uh, in a theory of international relations. We have to explain how certain countries with limited resources have much influence in international relations. 
If we look at the world as a system, and we have subsystems, yes, I agree, regional powers, for example, are by definition, almost by definition, like, like middle powers. In any system, we have some kind of hierarchy. And we need to build it, develop it, and understand it. Uh, be a distinguished actor in one particular field, such as water management, if it, if it is just water management, so that, that's fine, but it doesn't tell you much about the performance of that particular state on other issues in the international system. So in my theoretical understanding, it would not be qualified for a substantial power or, or, uh, or a middle uh, power. Um, if we look at the world in terms of functions or issues, the involvement of states in a number of them, especially those which are ignored by the superpowers or even objected to by the superpowers, and we have a level of countries that are trying to lead and, as I said earlier, even force the superpowers to deal with the problems even though they are not interested in doing so, and there are many, many examples of that. So I think that despite all the limitations, uh, the concept is still useful about global indices, which I've quoted in a number of them. Here the problem is the, dif the distinction between uh, uh, perception and reality. Uh, those global indices are highly publicized. And uh, we have, we have ch I've checked that in, in many traditional and new media publications. And therefore, they create or contribute to an image. And if you are ranked at the top, many countries are extensively use it. If you are ranked uh, at the bottom, others are using it against you. So even though some of those indices are inaccurate and misleading, they create impressions, they create images, and they create perceptions. And since, and since soft power and public, and public diplomacy is a lot about perceptions and images, then, then we have to take this into consideration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bilba. Now, Koreans would want to <clears throat> use the term middle power uh, because of our natural perception of Korea as not a superpower, the small power. And in fact, Korea is right in between China and Japan, the world's uh, second largest and the third largest country. And also, Korea is in between advanced and uh, developing uh, economies. And Korea is right between Eurasian continent and the Asia Pacific. And Korea is in the middle of unification. We are not a full power yet. So in that sense, we, ought, we would like to use the term middle power. Uh, but Professor Bilbo, um, since you mentioned this importance of the uh, discussion uh, on this concept, uh, from the, the Israel's viewpoint, uh, what would be the most important aspects of public diplomacy, according to your experience, in the Middle East? Uh, what, what kind of contribution and your um, perception of uh, public diplomacy would be very useful for peace and stability in the region? Well, this is a point that was well taken by Phil Sieb, and there is some similarity here between uh, Korea and Israel in the sense that both are uh, involved in, in a conflict, in a regional conflict. Uh, the, Israeli, or, uh, the Arab Israeli conflict is much more serious than the conflict perhaps you have in North Korea. So the question is how you, how you try to deal both with your position in a conflict and with other things that you do. And for Israel, the challenge was how to present what is known as the other face of the conflict, the other face of the country. And this has not been easy. And Israel made a big effort to present itself as a high-tech nation, uh, the startup nation. Uh, Israel has startups in second place in the world, just after the United States. It has more startups than uh, Britain, Italy, and France combined. So this is a big asset that you can use. But then people are saying, oh, you are, 
you are not resolving the conflict with the Palestinians, you are oppressing them, occupying them, etc. So all the advantages that you have may be overridden by the uh, burden uh, of uh, the conflict. So this is, this is one uh, specific area. The other area, I think, is, is, is completely ignored. And that is, you mentioned that, how you promote conflict resolution. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm under the impression that conflict resolution can be successful only if the sides uh, are ripe for resolution, if they are interested in resolution. And I think public diplomacy is a major tool to create those conditions necessary to make the concessions necessary to reach a resolution. And I think that both sides in the, Israeli, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict are not using sufficiently public, uh, public diplomacy tools to, to promote co conflict resolution. They don't use enough media to prepare for peace. They do exactly the opposite. Media is being used in the Middle East to incite for conflict and racism and confrontation. So this is, for me, a major indication, the use of public diplomacy and the media as, uh, as, an, ind as it's an indicator of willingness, of really serious willingness to resolve the conflict. So and I think that this would be true for other situations where the media could be used and public diplomacy could be used uh, to promote better understanding and to prepare better conditions for conflict resolution. If these conditions do not exist, my conclusion is that the sides are not yet prepared uh, to finally resolve the conflict uh, between them. Well, thank you very much. Let me ask um, one more question to Dr. Cha. Uh, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned that there are minimum preconditions for becoming middle powers, and those are um, capability and willingness and vision. Do you think that Korea uh, is well prepared to exercise this middle power diplomacy through the three minimum conditions that uh, you have mentioned, Dr. Chen. Yeah, uh, in the in the case of Korea, uh, we already uh, prepared uh, in capability and the willingness and the vision. Uh, embedded, uh, embedded as pact. Uh, the most important one is that uh, consistent policy of the government uh, and the communication with the civil society, uh, their own policy. Uh, through the uh, demo political democratization, uh, Korea enhance the communication with the civil society as well as the communication and the friendship with the outside world. Now, yep, yeah, in my view, we are well prepared. And I would like to add one, uh, one point that, uh, yes, clearly, uh, there is a limitation of the middle power dipl diplomacy, um, not only in official diplomacy, but also in public diplomacy. Sometimes, from the viewpoint of the eagle, oh, uh, sometimes uh, the eagles pretend, uh, sometimes sparrows pretend that he might be eagle. But from the viewpoint of, some, uh, sometimes from the viewpoint of the eagle, even the dove or the crows seems like a sparrow. Or the, oh, uh, so, but if some, uh, if the sun uh, have a crow or a dove, that uh, want to protect their babies, can defeat the eagles. That vision, the vision uh, of the willingness, sometimes can be a, that kind of dynamic for the middle power. Frankly speaking, uh, the superpower not only have a great hard power, but also a soft power that is much greater than any other middle powers. But we remind that 
And sometimes, why the uh, why soft power diplomacy of the superpowers cannot share and cannot sympathize, sympathize by others? Because example and uh, history of their own exercise of only the hard power. That's why I said that we go beyond the selfish national interest and make a common vision and a common goal. Because, yes, quite, yes, quietly, middle power has a Oh, middle power has, has a big vision, but very limited cap capabilities. But because the fact that they have, uh, they have a limited capability, they should try to sympathize themselves to other world, rather than course, uh, rather than be coercive or persuade the others. That's why in the mid and long term, middle power diplomacy oh, can expand its realm and partners. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned sparrows and eagles. Um, this is very interesting. Um, Korea may be somewhere in between the sparrow and eagles flying uh, with a willingness to contribute to peace and stability uh, in the region. Uh, right now, Korea is not having a very good relationship with Japan, for example. Uh, we are very close neighbors. We share democracy and free markets, uh, but we don't see eye to eye with each other. Uh, from Korean viewpoint, Japan hasn't come to terms with its own past. Japan thinks that they want to become a normal country uh, with, a, with the armed forces and collective self-defense. Um, if I can ask a question, Dr. Cha. Um, what kind of constructive public diplomacy uh, we can try to improve the situation between uh, Korea and Japan uh, at this time uh, of difficult relationship? Do you think there are any roles that public diplomacy can play in, 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 in this, uh, this region? Okay, can I just add, uh, do you think that Japan does not understand that the past is in the middle of improving relations with uh, with Korea? Is this is something that they don't understand? Or this is something that they, they, they do understand, but uh, are incapable of overcoming? Okay, I'm supposed to ask questions. <laughs> 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 um, I think that we have a perception gap uh, about the history, uh, what it means for the contemporary world, and what does Japan understand uh, about the wrongdoings uh, that they have done in the past, uh, including the textbook issue, the history issue, comfort women issue, Yaskuni shrine, uh, and everything. So there's a kind of wide gap between the two countries. And I, I think that uh, this is a kind of issue that public diplomacy should play its role to bring the perception closer between the two peoples through media, through seminar, and through public discourse uh, on the common issues that we are faced with. So that is my question to uh, Dr. Chan. Oh, as the, uh, Dr. Park uh, already um, introduced me uh, as uh, originally security specialist. Uh, frankly speaking, the concept of public diplomacy is originated through from to persuade or propagand and advertise its own strategic position to the outside world by the superpowers. By the military side, public diplomacy can be used at the same world as a strategic communication to justify the to, to justify its military operation or the war toward the people that are conquered or invaded. Basically, the original the public diplomacy is a yeah, tool of propaganda. It's a start point, but oh, the hard power is a power 
to impose my will to others, the soft power of the 20th century, uh, 20th century is a power to persuade the others with my position, to my position. Uh, in my view, the real soft power of 21st century is to sympathize myself to others. For that purpose, the communication among government, uh, the communication among civil society is much more than important, as well as the uh, communication between government and government. Uh, in the case of the yes, uh, Korean-Japan relations, there is a yes, uh, we also think of the problems in the bilateral relations uh, between two governments. The more big problem is the communication channel between two civil society is totally shut down since the last two or three months ago. Thus, if we restore uh, the relations between Korea and Japan from the public met uh, diplomatic method, the government of two sides are uh, concerned about to facilitate the communication and dialogue uh, in the level of, uh, among the level of civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me open the floor for um, questions and answers. Please um, identify yourself briefly and make a very uh, succinct, uh, clear uh, questions. Yes, gentlemen. I'm uh, Peter Howarth uh, from Australia. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank the Korean Foundation for inviting me and, in fact, uh, organizing this, uh, what I think is a very important uh, seminar. Um, the, the observation I, I would make is um, that uh, the idea of a middle power network um, came in Australia from um, our former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, Kevin Rudd. Uh, he was, um, uh, one of the things that he encouraged us to think about um, was the idea of Australia not only as a middle power, but also as a creative middle power. And I think that adjective creative is very important when we think about what middle powers can do. And this brings me to the whole uh, question which I think um, is an important element in considering the assets that middle powers have, and that is the role of think tanks. Now, think tanks, I believe, are very, uh, can play a very important role uh, for middle powers. Um, think tanks not only serve uh, as a bridge between governments and civil society uh, and the academic world, but they're also a source of, um, of ideas and creativity in international relations and, and diplomacy. Uh, at a time when many foreign ministries have been uh, starved for resources, uh, think tanks, I think, have become uh, an essential element uh, of for middle powers and a, a form of soft power in themselves for middle powers to use. So I, I would um, be interested in the reflections of Dr. Cha and Dr. Sukma on the role of think tanks um, uh, as an asset uh, for middle powers to draw on, what sort of role uh, that think tanks should play going forward in um, developing the ideas for a public diplomacy strategy for middle powers. Um, I, I might just um, point out, too, that um, there seems to be a correlation between uh, the emergence of middle powers as a concept and the emergence of think tanks. Um, according to the GoTo uh, think tank um, survey, think tanks... Can you, can you wind up now? Yeah, think, now think that tanks two doubled questions, yes. in, the, in the aftermath of the Cold War. Uh, and... Uh, there seems to be this relationship between think tanks and middle powers. 
So I'd, I'd be very interested in uh, the comments of Dr. Cha and Dr. Sukhmar right, as representatives you. of think tanks thank on you. this issue. Um, I'll give them some time to think about the answers, but uh, maybe I can take a couple of more questions and uh, try to answer all the questions. Yes, gentlemen, please. My name is Denji Abdullahi from Nigeria. I would like to ask uh, where does the United Nations stand in this specter of promoting global public good through public diplomacy? Because I can see a lot of uh, United Nations agencies already doing a lot in the area of uh, promoting public good through public diplomacy. Is the structure of the United Nations presently inadequate to do this further? And that is why we are coming up with this concept of middle powers. And I would like to also ask the middle powers nation themselves, what, what role are they playing in, in terms of restructuring the United Nations so that it could actually work for everybody in the area of promoting public good through public diplomacy? Okay. My question yeah. can be answered by any of the panelists. By that, any of the panelists. Yes. All right, sir. Uh, let me Particularly have... the ambassador, William Patterson. So. Okay. Uh, let me have another question. Yes, the gentleman at the back, over there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Robinson, also from Australia. Too many Australians talking about middle powers, I know. Uh, quite often when you get a group of, let's say, middle-aged male diplomats and academics on a stage, the thinking becomes very, well, mainstream. I'd like to challenge the panel. Um, what about two countries which are very much middle powers but are often not considered about middle powers and two countries which have proven to be very strong and very influential in their public diplomacy? What does a panel think about Iran and Venezuela's position as middle powers and as states which are very good at public diplomacy? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> are there any members from Mexico or Turkey who are participants of the MITCA? Any com yes. Do you have any comments or any question to the panelist? Just a short question. Uh, my name is Ebu Bekir Ceylan from Turkey, uh, Vice Director of uh, Yunus Emre Institute. Uh, uh, presenters focused on the national interest and the uh, global common good. So uh, I wonder how to combine these national interests and uh, global common good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes, the, the gentleman over there. Yeah. Hello, <coughs> my name is Cesar Villanueva. I come from Mexico. Uh, my question would be for any of the panelists and in relation to the cultural issues uh, relevant for all the middle powers, particularly to the group we've been talking about, the, the uh, mixed. Uh, what, I, uh, what I think is uh, they, they seem to not have a, a similar cultural platform. Would that be an impediment to come together in in visions, in common visions, would culture culture be uh, uh, an aspect that uh, be uh, difficult to overcome, or is it an area of opportunity for the middle-sized countries, middle powers? Okay, um, I see one more question. Please give the microphone to the lady. Thank you so much, Caitlin Byrne from Australia. I, I wanted to just pick up on Ambassador Patterson's comment about really looking for some results from this MITCA network or grouping and whether timing, you, uh, firstly what sort of results might you think would be um, forthcoming and secondly is timing an issue when we think about aligning our national interest or moving away from aligning national interest with global public good, I, is there a tension there in terms of looking at short term, medium term or long term, it really picking up on, um, on some of the, the issues around timing. Okay, thank you. Now let me close the question session. 
Um, Ambassador Peterson, you might be the busiest person in the panel. <laughs> uh, there are three questions from Australia. Um, one is about the role of think tanks and the relationship with the public diplomacy. And the other one was, what about the other countries, the potential candidates for the middle power, one in the Middle East, Iran, and one in Latin America, Venezuela? Um, and then the final question on the result, what kind of result do you perceive uh, about the uh, activities of the MIDCA and the timing and issue for the global public good? Uh, Ambassador Patterson, would you like to go first? Uh, well, I'll go first, but I don't consider myself very well qualified to, to answer some of, these, uh, uh, some of these questions. I'll probably pretty much pass on the role of think tanks. I think they're very important. Uh, certainly in Australia, I think uh, they have a, uh, quite an impact on public policy development. Uh, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think, I think we might get some responses from others. I think our Nigerian colleague asked what role the, uh, the, the MICTA group or, or, or a group of this kind could have in helping restructuring the UN. I think that's in fact one of the motivating factors for a group of this kind, the fact that we can't get often effective or timely action out of the UN, uh, uh, the UN uh, General Assembly or the UN Security Council. And I, and I distinguish that with the work of specialised agencies, which I think in many cases are doing extremely good, uh, extremely good work. Um, it is, one of, I think, one of those topics that the MICTA group should be looking at up front, particularly now when uh, uh, Two of them are on the UN Security Council as non-permanent members, and, and the other members all will have had experience or will be coming onto that group. How do, we make, how do we make the UN Security Council more effective? How do we make the General Assembly more effective? I've always found that uh, the tortuous process of developing and floating resolutions in the UN, uh, I, mean, I mean, it takes up an enormous amount of resources, and often these resolutions are uh, ignored in the, in the breach. Uh, how, is, this, is a lot of this activity really worthwhile? How might we do it better? How, how might we build a consensus in an international community that, that, as I said, is close to 200 nations now, when it was, I think, around 50 at the time the UN was, was born? Uh, uh, another question from one of the, one of the Australians out there, uh, Iran and Venezuela, why not bring them in? There's no question that these are countries of substance, but I think, in many respects, they don't share the policy consensus of the current MICTA group. Uh, they, they, they aren't always prepared, I think, to abide by the sort of agreed rules-based international order. They haven't yet shown, in, in Iran's case at least, and, and, and arguably also in Venezuela, a commitment to uh, nuclear non-proliferation uh, and disarmament. I'm not an expert in this area, but uh, I think the, the willingness to sort of abide by international consensus on these sort of issues, to adhere to international, agreed international instruments is an important uh, indicator. Uh, you know, think there are some positive uh, moves in Iran at the moment, and hopefully we could move back to a situation where Iran um, would play a role in the international community, commensurate with its clear ability and its size. Um, uh, the final question, I think, what results can we get from MICTA? I'm not, I'm not yet sure, uh, and I don't think any of us really know this yet. It's just, again, we feel frustrated uh, by the inability of the broader uh, multilateral system to sometimes bring results which we believe are, in, are there for the common good and certainly in the interest of the five powers that have come together. Uh, timing, uh, again, that would be on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. I think. I think this, this whole process is, I'm going to give you an unsatisfactory answer because I think this whole process is exploratory. But is it worth attempting? Undoubtedly, I think it is. To explore where we can find common ground and then we decide how do we leverage that more broadly? Do we bring other people into, a, into some sort of lobbying consortium? Do we, do we propose a resolution at the UN and then lobby for it? Uh, do we... Do we uh, think there is a case for some other um, regional institution or some body to carry forward a, a, an area of activity. It's a, uh, I think it's too soon to too soon to say. But um, 
but the alternative is to do nothing when we have a group of active, capable, uh, motivated countries that share a set of common values and common outlook. Well, thank you. Are there any members of the panel? Uh, uh, Professor Gilboa. Uh, Peter, think tanks, huge asset for public diplomacy, both domestically and internationally. Why domestically? Because it helps the public and the government to think about ideas outside the box. Why internationally? Because think, think tanks connect with other think tanks, uh, with other sources of ideas. Our problem today is new ideas, how to deal with global and regional problems. Uh, all, all the ideas we have in some places have not worked, so we need new ideas. Internationally then, think tanks help to create a coalition or a partnership that then could be adopted by governments and international organizations and put, it the, uh, and put on the agenda. About, uh, about I, don't, I don't think that Iran and Venezuela have done a great job in public diplomacy. I think that if you get sanctions from all over the place, it represents the failure of public diplomacy. However, the new president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, uh, during his uh, recent trip to the United States, has done a major, uh, a major uh, operation of public diplomacy by the book. The diplomacy, just the, charm, the, 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 the charming diplomacy, just look at the words, charming diplomacy or the diplomacy of smiling, this is, this is a, one of the essential parts of public diplomacy, getting sympathy to your position, so maybe in the future uh, they, they will do much better. Cesar Villanova, from Mexico made a major point uh, on public diplomacy and we have talked about it. This is culture, not cultural diplomacy. I'm thinking about culture as, uh, as either an enabling platform for cooperation or as an impediment for, uh, for cooperation. Um, I th uh, Joe and I talked about values as a central component of public diplomacy. But if you have to deal with a value system that is exactly the opposite of yours, public diplomacy is not going to work. So for example, if, uh, if uh, uh, the United States were to use public diplomacy towards Iran based on values, it would not achieve anything. So we need to recognize how culture is crucial for the use of public diplomacy. If, if uh, there is a cultural impediment, then it has to be taken into consideration and it should be then figured into the public diplomacy effort in itself. So just to, re you have to go back to your question about Korea and Japan, so this, this is really a, an essential obstacle that has to be removed by public diplomacy in order to, uh, to enable public diplomacy. Thank you, Professor Gilboa. Um, are there any panel members? Uh, Dr. Sukuma, you want to respond to the think tank and the public diplomacy yes, the and brief, other uh, issues? Yes, uh, very briefly respond to that. Uh, there is another actually function of this think tank uh, in the public diplomacy, you know, because at least from experience of Indonesia and Australia, so it, those you know, uh, uh, forums initiated by the think tanks is very useful in order to have a frank and open you know, discussions about the problems you know, between the two countries that can actually go to the, uh, uh, contributing to the agreed understanding on both sides about the problem issues. You know, because all those official meetings usually is very nice. You, know, you, you, you meet, you hug, you kiss kiss, and then you go home. But you know, in the think tanks meeting, usually that's where we actually you know, can actually raise all those issues you know, that you know, can, uh, 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 when, uh, both countries can, you know, can work together in order to find you know, solutions. Venezuela and Iran, uh, I, yeah, uh, I think it's more like you know, a failure of American uh, public diplomacy rather than the success of Iran and Venezuela. When you look at you know, why Iran and Venezuela get a lot of you know, reports in many, you know, in many countries, especially in developing world. You know, simply you know, because, I don't think that is because they undertaken, you know, they have undertaken a great public diplomacy, but I think because the clumsiness of American public diplomacy when it comes to you know, Iran and, and, and Venezuela. Uh, but mind you, that, uh, we need to remember that uh, 
uh, uh, the uh, middle power again is not only about size and status. You know, it's also about the role. So you can be considered as middle power by becoming a problem, you know, and then suddenly you know become you know a, a power that can actually change things. Or you know you can also be considered as middle power by contributing you know to the uh, problem you know solving. So I think we are talking here about you know those middle powers. Uh, 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 in terms of ability, you know, to contribute to finding a solution rather than middle powers that become a problem. Uh, Dr. Chao. Uh, regarding the ask uh, on the law uh, of the think tank in the middle power countries, yes, clearly uh, the think tanks uh, of the middle power uh, countries uh, can contribute uh, to the uh, promotion and enhancing is the capability of middle powers uh, through the uh, uh, through making making the vision uh, or policy and the options uh, for their own countries. Uh, but uh, yes, they clearly they are uh, one of the one of the major assets and the major body of the public diplomacy of the middle powers, but not the only body because the middle power. Uh, the soft power, of the, uh, soft power of the middle power state is not solely consist of the uh, knowledge, uh, well well trained knowledge or education. It also contains the emotion, emotional approach. During serv uh, during service in Korea Foundation, I frequently experienced that effect. The song of weak, small and poor children was much more better than, or was much more impressive than any other well-trained, well-learned gentleman song or speech. That's public diplomacy. And as for the question about the role of the United Nations, yes, clearly United Nations can, uh, can contribute uh, or public diplomacy or uh, common goods, but they can only promote the cooperation among the countries or government. That's why when I borrow the, wa uh, borrow the famous wall, the uh, wall court of common sense, it's borrowed from the wa uh, famous wall, the, the uh, Ambassador Adelaide Stevens, uh, ambassador of the uh, United, uh, United States uh, to UN, United Nations, when the Cuba, um, during the Cuban mis Missile Crisis, he referred the United Nations as a court of world opinion, but it's only the court among the government and the countries for uh, facilitating uh, the communication and cooperation uh, beyond the government. So to say, cooperation, collaboration uh, among the people, among the NGOs, among the other organizations. Yes, United, United, United Nations has a law of supporters, not the law of leaders and hosts, in my view. Uh, and finally, uh, the, as for the uh, question about the uh, relation between the national interest uh, and the public diplomacy. Uh, uh, national interest and the common goods. Yes, in my view, there are two kinds of national interest. One is closely linked to the uh, common goods, but another is a uh, very selfish national interest that is uh, ignored. Uh, that can be realized when it, when he ignore the common goods. The most of the conflicting issues and problem is originated from the selfish national interest of the countries. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think the time is up. Um, it was a very stimulating and uh, in intensive session uh, this morning to talk about middle power and public diplomacy. We have um, afternoon session and also um, a dinner and your um, a workshop and konjiam uh, for the next couple of days. Um, you mentioned, the, one of the questions I mentioned, the creative middle power diplomacy. I think certainly creativity uh, is a very important element. Uh, Canadians uh, won't prefer the name constructive diplomacy. 
And I had a discussion with the Canadians on middle power diplomacy. So finally, we made a compromise as a constructive middle power diplomacy. And now, uh, in India, the brand name is Incredible India. And I was there recently to talk about middle power diplomacy. And Korea prefers dynamic Korea. So we said, well, if India and Korea cooperate, we can make incredible dynamism between the two countries. I think we had an incredible dynamism this morning uh, about the middle power and public diplomacy. I really um, thank all the panelists and the presenters for their active participation and insightful views. And also, I thank the floor for your contribution. Thank you very much. I'll close the session. Thank you.